Live from Chicago, this is Fox News at 9. After a long career in public service, now he's fighting not to serve time. Former Governor George Ryan in court today as jury selection begins in his trial on corruption charges. That story is first on Fox tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin Robinson. I'm Mark Sapelsa. With such a high-profile defendant, picking a jury offers a unique challenge. Reporter Larry Yellen covering the Ryan trial for us. He's live at the Dirksen Federal Building. Larry. Mark and Robin, it is turning out to be quite a challenge. For seven hours today, potential jurors were questioned one by one regarding their attitudes toward Governor Ryan, both in his years as governor and as secretary of state. The former governor sitting just 10 or 12 feet away from each one of them, eyeing them closely, knowing that in a couple of months, some of them will be called upon to decide his fate. Former Governor Ryan wasn't talking to reporters as he arrived in a white van at the Dirksen Federal Building this morning. His attorney is Dan Webb. Spent the morning with him. He's fine. He's comfortable. He's, he knows he's not guilty, and we're going to proceed with the trial. The governor's wife arrived separately. Prosecutors wanted her excluded from the courtroom because she could be a witness. But Webb told the judge that the governor needed her for emotional support. For the time being, she's allowed in. The governor is charged with accepting cash and gifts in return for helping close friends like co-defendant Larry Warner get business from the state. The first day of jury selection went more slowly than expected, with Ryan's attorneys subjecting potential jurors to lengthy questioning. We want a jury that's fair and impartial, fair to both sides. We're going to go through the process and pick a fair jury and we'll get started at that time. One potential juror, the owner of a candy packaging company, said he had not heard much about the Ryan administration. License for bribes, that's it. I don't remember any details. Another man, a 911 supervisor, said George Ryan did not impress me as the leader of our state. Part of the reason? He claimed that at a banquet, the governor introduced Bears legend Dick Butkus, but introduced him as Mike Ditka. And a third potential juror was disqualified after saying, I just don't like old people going to jail. By day's end, 11 potential jurors had been rejected. Only eight potential jurors survived, but another 50 are needed before the attorneys make their final cuts. The former governor left just after 6 p.m. Governor, a good day today? Every day is a good day. So just what is each side looking for in a jury? Well, the prosecutors appear to be looking for jurors who will not be influenced by factors or issues like the death penalty that are not expected to be introduced inside the courtroom. The defense lawyers, meanwhile, appear to be looking for jurors who will stand by their convictions, even if they are eventually outnumbered on the jury. Live at the Dirksen Federal Building, Larry Yellen, Fox News, Chicago. Mark. Okay, Larry, thank you. And just hours before the Ryan Harris civil case goes to the jury, the city reaches a settlement with a boy suing for false arrest. This deal, though, worth three times the amount the city paid to the other former young defendant. Craig Wall joins us in the newsroom with a story. Craig? Mark, the settlement will pay the now 15-year-old boy $6.2 million. It ends a trial that started seven weeks ago and was headed for closing arguments. But under pressure from the city council, the city's lawyers made an offer the victim and his family just couldn't refuse. I'm very happy, very happy. It's a long, drawn out um, situation that we was in too that we shouldn't have never been in in the first place. Seven years after E.H. was falsely charged with murdering Ryan Harris, he and his family are getting some justice. The $6.2 million settlement offer from Corporation Counsel Mara Georges was short of the $10 million E.H.'s lawyers were seeking, but it was enough for the family. She put a, a dollar amount on the table that our clients could not refuse. I advise them against it because I don't think it really represents adequately what transpired in this case. E.H. was just eight in 1998 when he and a seven-year-old friend were charged with killing Harris and sexually assaulting her. The boys were later cleared after semen was found on the girl's clothes. A convicted sex offender is now awaiting trial. Two Chicago detectives were sued for false arrest but remain on the force. Were these officers guilty of willful and wanton misconduct? And my answer to you is they were not. But the corporation counsel's office was worried a jury might disagree and told the city council a verdict could run from 30 to 50 million dollars. Last week, the council ordered the city's lawyers to settle and seven weeks after it started, on the day the case was headed to the jury, it settled with jurors apparently split. The time that it took was the time that it took. 
and you know how it turned out that was the law's way of working itself out. The settlement means the most for the boy and his family, but 6th Ward Alderman Fredrina Lyle says it means a lot for the Inglewood community too. It's very important for healing because it closes it, it ends it. What was happening was that every day there would be another piece in the newspaper about what happened today. And that was like reliving the whole incident day by day by day. Last week, the city refused to talk about the offer on the table at the time, but we've now learned it was just $3 million, an amount unacceptable to EH's family and their attorneys, given the fact that the city's privately hired lawyers, headed up by former corporation counsel Brian Crow, have billed the city for $3 million defending both cases. Robin, back to you. And, of course, Craig, the first defendant accepting $2 million, yeah. that must be all a buzz in the legal community tonight. Yeah, and it did, uh, there's some talk that maybe they're going to try to see if they can't get that changed. Both this settlement and the other one have to be approved by the city council. The other one already approved, but this one may get approved by the council on their October 6th meeting. All right. Thanks, Craig Wall. And our voice your choice tonight. Do you agree with the $6.2 million settlement in the Ryan Harris case? If your answer is yes, call 1-900-988-5276. If you don't agree with the settlement amount or the settlement, answer no by calling 1-900-988-5277. Each call will cost you 75 cents. We ask that you please be over the age of 18 to call in. We're going to show you the numbers again in a few minutes so you can have a chance to call, and we'll have the results later in this newscast. Police in other states are asking the Chicago area police to watch for a man suspected in three murders, two in northwest Indiana, one in Ohio. The most recent happened this morning in Remington, Indiana, where two female convenience store clerks were shot during an attempted robbery. Security cameras at that store helped identify 43-year-old Melvin Keeling as a suspect. He's also a suspect in the death of a 13-year-old girl near Cincinnati a few hours earlier. The teen was shot at her grandmother's home in Warren County. Police believe Keeling is driving a 2000 silver Ford Windstar with an Ohio license plate number DW18AW. Already lawsuits filed today try to lay blame for this weekend's deadly train crash, though bad weather is getting in the way of the official search for answers. Federal investigators say the Metro train was traveling too fast, but they don't know exactly why. And the National Transportation Safety Board is offering an update on the derailment at this hour. Lily Cohn is there with a live report. Lil. Robin, the NTSB chairman is still briefing reporters upstairs here at the Ramada Inn. He tells us that investigators will be looking at human components as well as mechanical ones as they try to figure out what went wrong. That train's engineer should not have been going over 10 miles an hour as he tried to switch tracks. Instead, he was doing close to 70. The inbound train careened off the tracks and pushed the fourth car into the 47th Street Bridge. That's where two women who were killed were sitting, 22-year-old Jane Cuthbert and 38-year-old Allison Walsh. Never in the history of Metro have we lost passengers because of a derailment. Today, Metro officials offered a heartfelt apology and a promise to its riders to find out exactly what went wrong and correct it. I think it's the tracks. They need new, new tracks and a new system. I think for most of us, especially with gas prices where they are, we, you know, we have to ride Metro. It's our, it's our way to get to and from our jobs. So I think you put it in the back of your mind and you do what you need to do. This morning's rain forced the NTSB investigators to delay a simulation of the crash. It has been rescheduled for tomorrow. In the meantime, Metro officials say the train's engineer, Michael Smith, is on leave with pay. He joined Metro as a Rock Island engineer only 45 days ago, but had spent five years driving freight trains for CSX. Now investigators want to know why the same locomotive involved in a crash two years ago derailed Saturday at the same switching point. Lawyers filing suit want to know the same thing. Is there something about the way this track is designed where the crossover takes place at this location, which could allow something like this to happen two years apart. Tonight, the NTSB chairman told reporters that investigators are making good progress. We gathered a great deal of information, and tomorrow we will be walking through the coaches with the first responders to uh, learn what they did, to understand more about the evacuation techniques, 
And those NTSB investigators have been uh, looking at human components uh, as well as maintenance logs and employment records. We're told that the train's engineer was initially hospitalized under a suicide watch. He has since been released. However, 11 victims of that train crash still remain hospitalized tonight. Live here at the Ramada Inn on the south side, Lilia Chacon, Fox News, Chicago. And Lilia, news about uh, one woman dying in the derailment has been hard for Brookfield Zoo. Allison Walsh designed computer programs at the zoo. Her work helped monitor animal behavior and improve conditions for them. She was on her way to a zoological meeting on Saturday when the accident happened. Over the years, she won several awards for her software, which is now used in the wild. One of those people who never took or needed credit, but worked heartily behind the scenes, uh, dedicating her life to her work. Uh, that was the main things about Allison we all loved. Brookfield Zoo is planning a private service for co-workers to remember her. It's also working on a memorial fund to continue her work. Stay with Fox News for the investigation into the train derailment. Our coverage resumes tomorrow morning, Fox News, 5 a.m. Well, here we go again. Let's just hope we don't go all the way there. Tropical weather threatening the United States. This time it is Tropical Storm Rita, South Florida, the first target. Both the locals and the tourists have been ordered out of the Florida Keys. Right now, Rita is picking it's up like strength in the Bahamas. Forecasters say it will reach hurricane strength by the time it hits the Keys tomorrow. In Miami, lines are forming outside gas stations, people trying to get to safety. By the way, we can expect higher gas prices because of Rita already, because the storm could threaten oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. Oil prices jumped already today. Meteorologist Rick DeMiles tracking Rita, working on our own forecast as well. He's here now with a first look at the weather. Rick. Hey, doing, Robin? Another good looking day in Chicago. Check out the highs well up into the 80s. We had a little bit of rain come through early this morning, but the bulk of the afternoon severe weather stayed well down to the south. Places like Peoria and Kankakee really got hammered during the dinner time hours. Speaking of Rita, this is the way it looks like right now. The storm is continuing to move off to the west, and notice it is beginning to strengthen. And as Robin mentioned, expected to become a hurricane probably by later on tonight. Maximum sustained winds currently just a shade under hurricane strength at 70 miles per hour. Big question is where does Rita go and what effect will it have? On the U.S. coast, we'll come back with the full forecast and the latest track from the National Hurricane Center. All that coming up in just a few minutes. Mark and Robin. Okay, Rick. And Rita causing a new headache for the city of New Orleans, if they need that. Story in two minutes on Fox News. Also coming up, a first-hand look at Hurricane Katrina's devastation as Chicago police and firefighters returning with some heart-wrenching stories. Plus, transit security. There's no such thing as perfectly safe in this world. TA knows it's a target for terrorists, but is it moving fast enough to protect commuters? I'll have a closer look tonight. And what our nails can tell us about our health. Margaret Shortridge has a preview. Margaret? Well, Mark and Robin, many of us polish and pamper our nails, but before we do all that, we should take a good look at them. They can give us clues to our health. I'll have that story later in our Fox Family and Health Report. You're watching Fox News at 9. I'm Danielle Serino. You eat while you walk, you eat while you drive, you're going to get those eats on yourself. That's why Tide has come up with a stain stopper designed to work while you're on the go. But will it take out the spots or just take up your time? That's coming up on the bottom line in our second half hour. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks, but first, an about face from the mayor of New Orleans. He's now telling people to leave the city again. Ray Nagin says Tropical Storm Rita could bring new flooding. His announcement coming just hours after... Residents began returning to Algiers, the neighborhood across the river from the French Quarter. It also followed stern warnings from the top federal officials, including President Bush, that the city remains unsafe. The mayor, you know, he's got this dream about having a city uh, up and running, and we share that dream. But we also want to be realistic about uh, some of the hurdles and obstacles that, are, that, that we all confront. Our pumping stations are not at full capacity. And any type of storm that heads this way and hits us will put the East Bank of Orleans Parish in very significant harm's way. So I'm encouraging everyone to leave. Negan wants everybody out by Wednesday. Earlier, he criticized the feds for uh, not uh, allowing residents to return to New Orleans. Dozens of Chicago police and firefighters are happy to be home after two weeks in the hurricane zone. They volunteered their services shortly after the hurricane hit. Tonight, the rescuers returned, telling us nothing could have prepared them for what they saw. 
Nancy Pendrick joins us with their story. Nancy. Oh, so true, Mark and Robin. And what they saw was dead bodies, devastated homes and lives, and a stench so intense that keeping food down was a challenge for these guys. But now they're home, back from a different kind of war zone, getting the heroes welcome they so very much deserve. With all the pomp and circumstance of a soldier returning home from battle, these Chicago police officers were welcomed back to the city with handshakes, hugs and kisses, a show of appreciation for the two weeks they spent in New Orleans, doing whatever they could to bring relief to the city and its people. It's the longest we've been apart in 25 years, to be honest, so it was tough. People died down there trying to protect what little they had. They stayed with it, they didn't want to leave. You know, and, and that was the biggest thing that hit us. The officers helped in the rescue effort, going house to house in putrid waters, looking for and in some cases finding survivors. But they also faced the grim task of retrieving bodies. It was incredible, and um, it's very difficult to comprehend if you don't see it. Having seen it, um, uh, I feel blown away. Some 35 Chicago firefighters also volunteered their efforts in New Orleans and they too got a sense of how much they were missed when they returned home. They were making a difference and, and we're all really very proud of them and we're glad they're home safe and sound. Most were responsible for putting out fires, cleaning up debris and looking for survivors, even the canine kind. But sometimes just being there was enough. They would just break out in tears and, and we just walk up and hug them. So that was really important to just support them. Well, this isn't the first time that these officers and firefighters have seen such devastation. Many of them were quick to head off to New York after 9-11. It's not pleasant work, but quite rewarding for these guys. They get much satisfaction out of knowing that they've made a difference in someone's life. Really a pleasure to meet these guys. They care so much about their fellow human beings, and it was nice to and spend some time with them. While a lot of civilians might have liked to go, they're the trained people that they really needed down there. So. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Love Thank the you. shots of those kids, too. Yeah. yeah. Heartwarming, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> North Korea is going to stop producing nuclear weapons, they say. That story tops our news briefs. North Korea today agreed to dismantle its nuclear weapons program. It's taken years of pressure from six countries, including the United States. In exchange, though, North Korea gets energy assistance, economic aid, and a promise that it will not be attacked by the U.S. North Korea also agreed to inspections by international agents. This is a major victory. President Bush called the decision a positive step, but said North Korea now has to keep its promise to the world. Long prison sentences for two former Tyco executives who became symbols of greed in corporate America. Former CEO Dennis Kozlowski, former CFO Mark Schwartz here, will each spend up to 25 years, possibly, behind bars for stealing millions from the company. Kozlowski was also fined $70 million. Schwartz hit for $35 million. And NASA has announced plans to send astronauts back to the moon, but it'll be a while from now. It is developing a new spacecraft called the Crew Exploration Vehicle, but it won't be ready for a moon landing until 2018. No one has set foot on the moon since 1972. The new spacecraft, well, at least no one that we know of, mm -hmm. the new spacecraft will carry four people <laughs> and will allow them to stay on the moon for a week. What year was that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're probably right. Still ahead, keys to our health could be at our fingertips. Minor changes in our fingernails could be signs of major health problems. We'll tell you what to look for next. And a party for a miracle baby who reaches a milestone. And here's Rick. Another good looking day in Chicago, but we could have another hurricane on our hands in the Gulf of Mexico. Full forecast track coming right up. Many people spend a lot of time and money to make sure their nails look great. Before you cover them with polish, though, take a good look. You are supposed to look. Mm, just bite them too often. Our fingernails can tell a lot about our health. Margaret Short, which explains in tonight's Fox Family and Health Report. We are not addressing biting nails. All right, then. <laughs> this is a totally different topic. Mark and Robin, changes in fingernails can be subtle signals pointing to everything from cancer to heart disease. That's why it's important to pay close attention to what your nails might be trying to tell you. The eyes are known as the window to the soul, and your nails can serve as the windows to your health. 
Have they changed over time? Along with taking a patient's temperature and blood pressure, some doctors are adding a thorough nail exam to their routine. Lots of common diseases can present themselves through the appearance of your nails. Doctors say the typical healthy nail is fairly flat, pink, and even in color. You always want to be aware of any changes in shape of the nail, thickness, consistency, looking at the surface, the color of the nail, whether the nail is separated from the nail bed. If your nails are half white and half pink, that could mean you have kidney disease. If you see nail pitting, sometimes that can indicate a patient has psoriasis, one of the skin disorders. Yellow nails with a slight blush at the base is sometimes a symptom of diabetes. Thyroid disease is another very common disease. Your nails get brittle, they don't grow as quickly, they seem to break easily. A very pale nail bed may indicate anemia. Sometimes there's a darker pigmentation within the nail, so black lines, and that can be normal for some people, particularly in African Americans or darker skinned people. However, you want to always be aware if there's a sudden change in that, that could also indicate melanoma. A red nail bed could mean you have heart disease. Liver disease is another thing that can cause nail changes in the way uh, nails are shaped. Doctors stress that nails are not a tell-all. They're just a small part of the big picture. If you have heart disease, you're going to look at the nails, you're going to listen to the heart, and then you may do some blood testing or some sort of other sophisticated testing and say, yes, you know, you probably have heart disease. Most importantly, if you notice any changes, bring it up with your doctor because it could help nail your diagnosis. Now, the most common change in your nails may be the appearance of ridges, but that's not typically a sign of illness, just a sign of aging. Mark and Robin, these are not like be all end all. Yeah, these so the are carpenter, just indications. The carpenter's not going to walk up to you and say, look at I just hammered 17 right, right. of these. Right. Yeah. This is just something if you see it, you should probably talk to your doctor about if it. If it changes from what it usually right. is. All right, right. right. Thanks, Thanks, Margaret. Good. Interesting. Family from suburban Hanover Park held a birthday party they once feared would never happen. When Ramesha Rahman was born a year ago, she weighed 8.6 ounces. That's less than a can of pop. Well, look at her today. One year old, 13 pounds. It's believed she is the smallest baby ever to survive. She and her twin sister celebrated their first birthday along with their family and doctors at Loyola Medical Center. They play with each other, they, they, try, they pull their legs, their hands, their hairs. They love to play with their feet. You know. <laughs> one another's feet and you know they start imitating you know for the last few weeks. Hmm. Doctors said they are developing normally but they bear watching closely for a long time. Their nails look really healthy. That's <laughs> right. Little bitty, little bitty. Just I love the little fingers. We'll get a break from the rain for the next few days. You'll probably like Richard Miles forecast. Also coming up is the CTA prepared to fight terrorism. I'll look at what the transit agency has done and what it still must do. We'll also have this. And we'll try a fresh tomato and some iced tea. Yeah, but don't try it on your clothes. Meant to be a quick fix for sudden stains. Is it worth your time and money? That story later on The Bottom Line. This portion of Fox News is brought to you by American Family Insurance. The Perez Family, Chicagoland, Northwest Indiana, Pontiac dealer. Well, first you don't get any rain for a year and a half, and then when you get it, it is loud, boisterous, and causes some damage. Yeah, you didn't even need an alarm <laughs> clock this morning no. to wake up. No. That stuff was coming down pretty hard. Uh, the second batch missed us this afternoon, but we're going to switch gears totally here and talk about something that we here we go again, once again, with another potential hurricane moving through the Gulf of Mexico. This is Tropical Storm Rita. Maximum sustained winds up to about 70 miles per hour, and you can see it's moving in almost the same way. That Katrina was about two or three weeks ago, but this one doesn't look, look, look as powerful as the storm system is still beginning to gather some strength and intensity. Trust us, we don't want another hurricane, but all indications show that this thing is going to develop quite rapidly. And just in the last couple of hours, this has gone from somewhat of a disorganized tropical storm to a very organized storm right in through there, and it's expected to move right across the Keys as early as tomorrow morning. Check out the latest hurricane track. This thing will move across the Keys probably as a Category 1 storm. Take a couple of days across the southern sections of the Gulf of Mexico and now look where it's moving. Not towards New Orleans but maybe around the Houston Galveston area as early as Friday night and into Saturday morning and the forecast guidance suggests this could be as high 
as a Category 3 hurricane packing winds as high as 120 miles per hour. It still could weaken, it still could move off to the west and the south, but right now all the long-range forecast models suggest this is probably the best scenario, at least the most favorable, for this particular storm. In Chicago, once again, another great day. Temperatures about 10 to 12 degrees above average. Normal high 73, made it up to 84 today. Half-inch rain officially at O'Hare Field, some places to the north a little bit more and even some damage across northern sections of McHenry County around the Crystal Lake area where they had some large trees blown down with the first batch of storms that moved through early this morning. There is a bit of a cool front moving through. Notice it's 76 in O'Hare, 69 at Waukegan. Winds now beginning to shift out to the north, and there's a couple of big thunderstorms out across the eastern sections of Lake Michigan moving in that direction. So if you're watching us from one of the high rises downtown, you can actually look off to the east and see some lightning. But the cooler weather is way up to the north, and it's really not expected to get here anytime soon. The cool front coming through is actually very weak, but still strong enough to touch off a couple of showers and some heavy thunderstorms. What you will notice tomorrow is the humidity. That should be down quite a bit from what we had today. Dew points were in the 70s, but as that rain moves east and high pressure begins to build in from the west, we should dry things out nicely, as well as develop quite a bit of sunshine. Southerly winds on the back side of this high will actually boost temperatures right up to where they were today, probably in the low 80s, and maybe even low to mid 80s during the day once again on Wednesday as uh, Tropical Storm Rita continues to move down to the south. Forecast tonight looks pretty good. A couple of showers and thunderstorms well off to the south and east. Overnight lows in the 50s. Good looking day tomorrow. High 82, the normal high 73. And the last official day of summer is going to feel like the middle of summer with temperatures in the mid 80s. Matter of fact, the seven day forecast keeps us warm right through Thursday. Even a bit of a cool off for Friday, Saturday. No big deal as our nice summer weather continues until further notice. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Still ahead, if you ride a bus or a train in this city, stick around to watch Mark's story. Is the CTA ready for a terror attack? Next in my closer look. This portion of Fox News is brought to you by your Chicagoland and Northwest Indiana Chevy dealers. For four years in a row, you've made Chevy the number one selling cars and trucks in Chicagoland. Something that outstanding deserves a huge thank you. Chevy presents an American Revolution concert featuring Jessica Simpson live October 1st at the Tweeter Center. It's big and it's on us. That's an American Revolution. From your Chicagoland and Northwest Indiana Chevy dealers, log on to ChicagoRevolution.com for concert details. Jenkins. Jenkins. Do you know where Jenkins sits? <sighs> Sir? Jenkins doesn't actually work here. But he's around all the time. I, I saw him here this morning. Yeah, he's our uh, software supplier. From Chicago. Sir? Here you go, Mr. Jenkins. Now you can fly American for less than you think. See you back here for Thursday's meeting? I'll be here. Thank you. Lower fares, fewer restrictions every day. I was going to give him a raise. We know why you fly. We're American Airlines. David Boreanaz and Emily Deschanel star. Give my forensic anthropologist some room. Your forensic anthropologist? Bones, Tuesday at 7 on Fox Chicago. Whether you're looking for a home or looking for an agent, look to Remax online for all the answers. Remax, outstanding agents, outstanding results. In 1882, Norman Harris arrived in Chicago with a dream. It became Chicago's hometown bank. Now helping customers throughout Chicagoland live their dreams. Serving businesses large, small, and petite. Helping couples buy homes. Advising families who've been here for generations. No matter who you are, you and your dreams are always welcome at Harris. Lion Power, with you all the way. You're watching Fox News at 9. Even before 9-11, terrorists were targeting buses and trains. We've watched them hit transit in Tokyo, Madrid, and London. Experts say it's only a matter of time before they strike here in the United States. So what are we doing to stop them, and is it enough? Mark has the story tonight. Mark. Robin, picture uh, the crushing holiday crowds at Chicago's airports. Well, more people rode the CTA today than will pass through O'Hare and Midway over the entire Thanksgiving weekend. Yet the feds only provide a penny per passenger for security on buses or trains compared to seven or eight bucks each for plane passengers. 
In my closer look tonight, a rare look at what the CTA has done and has not done to protect a known target. We can see in real time what's going on. This is the CTA's newest weapon against crime and terrorism. Live camera feeds from the Douglas branch of the Blue Line. Crystal clear images of passengers and platforms. The kind of surveillance that proved crucial in London this summer. How soon in terms of months, years, will you have the system camera ready? The, the real answer is it's never completely done. So far, only 17 of 144 rail stations have cameras. None are yet plugged into the city's 911 center. In fact, they're not even all connected here to the CTA operations center. And while every bus has cameras, they can't be monitored. Do you think you're moving quickly enough in this world of terror that we live in? I think there's always the question of, you'd always like to be able to do more things uh, more quickly. The CTA hopes to install nearly 1,200 cameras by the end of next year, many of them in Chicago subways, a potential target that seems sorely lacking in surveillance. The technology is great so far as it goes, but when a terrorist strikes or a natural disaster hits our city, we can't count on the technological toys. Transit watchdog Jackie Levy says cameras are good, but not enough. She'd like to see more people with trained eyes and ears working the system. We see the K-9 patrol and the Chicago cops down here for a festival. We don't see them on a routine basis. In New York City, police officers with automatic weapons patrol platforms. K-9 teams climb aboard trains checking for explosives. And this summer, police started inspecting passengers' bags. Here in Chicago, passengers describe security sweeps as scattered and hurried, with officers only peeking in windows. Back in New York, cops stand guard wherever tunnels meet rivers. Chicago uses private patrols at these sensitive posts. They're unarmed and make only nine bucks an hour. There's no such thing as perfectly safe in this world. That's part of the importance of letting our customers know and the public know that if you see something, say something. Don't wait till after the fact and say that did seem suspicious to me. But critics say even Chicago's see something, say something campaign falls flat. Compare this poster to one from New York, which screams, take your things or we will. And even that pales in comparison with classic propaganda from World War II. The thing is not to be terrified by terrorism. That's the, the point of terrorism is to try to terrify people. Since the September 11th attacks, the CTA has spent more than $150 million on security. They've invested in safety, too. Should the worst happen, how would you escape? Heavy wooden gangplanks will help car-to-car -car evacuations. And these sturdy ladders should help if you have to climb down onto the tracks. Before you panic and reach to open a door, stay put and wait for instructions. Don't do this. Don't do this. This is last resort. This is absolute what I would call last resort. The CTA's added intercoms to each rail car. You'll find them under these blue lights. They're designed to let passengers talk with the train operator, often the only source of help. The CTA fired its conductors nearly a decade ago, so the rail operators work alone on trains with as many as 1,300 riders. What car number are we on? Uh, you can look right on the, uh, Hello? Yeah, we're here. The intercom hiccuped during a demonstration for our cameras. We work very hard to make sure that those are uh, maintained in good order. Problems persist with overhead announcements, too. But Cruzy says they've fixed key problems like dead zones in the subway where emergency radios would fail. We have actually just completed the upgrade of that. Two weeks ago it went live, and so we now have full coverage, and it's much better uh, throughout the system. The CTA will soon add cell phone service underground to further boost communications. They'll be able to quickly turn the system off to thwart cell phone bombs like those used in Madrid. We've learned lessons, and we're going to be learning more. These new trash bags came from London and should make it easier to spot a bomb. The fact that some see an attack on a major U.S. transit system as inevitable doesn't stop Cruzy and his team. I think that the attitude that you can't stop something uh, doesn't, shouldn't translate into don't try to. The CTA says putting that second person back on the L, the conductor, would cost $13 million a year, and conductors were never meant to be security guards, they say. CTA reminding us crime continues to fall on the trains, and we don't see every security precaution that they put up, like uh, undercover cops who ride the system. But the challenge remains, Robin, that protecting a known target like the CTA is awfully tough when you're trying to get everybody to work on time. And if, if they could at least enlist all the passengers as, as being, you know, see something, say something, right. whatever the case may be. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. Still ahead on Fox News, can a popular detergent turn the tide on nasty stains when you can't get to a washing machine or even a sink? A product test and the bottom line on the results.
actually it looks like it's really taking this thing. Save yourself from those stubborn stains. <laughs> They're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a Tide commercial? Well, the makers of the new Tide to Go say they've got you covered. Well, the product for all those people that eat on the go, which is everybody, isn't it? Danielle Serino brought along some stubborn stains of her own. She joins us with tonight's bottom line. You have everything. You even have stubborn stains of your own. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't make the coffee stains up, but let's see if Tide to Go works right now, Mark and Robin. I'm going to spill a little bit of coffee on this shirt. Oops, and see if the pen can stop it from sticking. We'll have the results in a few minutes. I'm going to use the pen in the meantime. Let's see what happened when a tester told Todd to go to go to work. Thank you, Bob. Have you ever found yourself, whoops, in this position, about to be upstaged by a stubborn stain? Well, when you're teaching kids, they notice everything. Ken is a computer teacher and says he's been embarrassed more than once. It takes away their focus. They're not paying attention at that point. Insightful, tenacious. Which is why he says this commercial for Tide to Go caught his eye. It's supposed to combat fresh food stains on contact. I mean, just look at the results. The stain in the commercial is gone. Let's take a look and see what we've got. I think I've got a bottle of wine in here. Okay, we'll try a fresh tomato and some iced tea. Fox asked Ken to forage through his fridge and find a few stain makers. To add to the ones Fox brought along, ketchup, mustard, cola, wine, whoops, iced tea, and a fresh tomato. It's a mess. <laughs> Looks great. The manufacturer's directions say to block the stains to pick up excess liquid, then release the stain-fighting solution from the pen. Squeezing the tip, letting some of the product go. And gently rub the stain. It seemed to work on certain spots, it looks like it's really taken the stain away. But overall, the results were a bit splotchy. I could still see mustard. It doesn't look like it's getting the tomato out too good either. But wait a second. New Tide to Go. In the commercial, the stain came right out. Surely it has to work on something. Wow. <laughs> then the tide suddenly seemed to turn. That's amazing. It took the stain right out. The one stain that Tide to Go took out completely was from a liquid the manufacturer provided <laughs> for the test, the and it was the only stain that came out completely. Mm. Makers of Tide to Go say they're not surprised the mustard stain didn't come out since their product is not effective on all stains and isn't formulated to help with particularly greasy ones at all. However, it is supposed to work on coffee, ketchup, soda, and tomato juice, which were the ones we tested. As for that coffee stain we made a few minutes ago, Take a look. I see it. Still there. Yeah. That's the bottom line, Mark and Robin. Okay. So only if you get that stuff that Tide sends you on your clothes. I guess that's what works. The stuff we tried didn't do that well. Thanks, Danielle. I'm sure they'll be the first Good idea. to it. Yeah. <laughs> For us messy people. Mm -hmm. When we come back, your voice, your choice results on the Ryan Harris case. Also, the real test for American Idol wannabes in Chicago, surviving the wrath of Simon. I'm Corey McFerrin. We've got sports coming up live from the cell where Maalox is the drink of choice. The White Sox going south. The Indians coming north in a hurry. What will happen when they collide here tonight? we got highlights and more just ahead. This portion of Fox News is brought to you by Hyundai. Some finer points of narrowed down American Idol hopefuls in Chicago face the real <laughs> test tomorrow. Simon Cowell. He, Paula Abdul, and Randy Jackson will be in Chicago to judge round three of auditions taking place at the W Hotel downtown starting at 8 a.m. Last week, thousands of people lined up outside Soldier Field to get a shot of the limelight. Those who survived Friday were called back Saturday. Now the remaining one, I mean ones, have to face <laughs> the big three. I'm sure there's a few of them. Freudian slip. All right, now cue that music. The Sox look to increase their slim lead in the American League Central with, oh, those rival Indians who are creeping up fast, actually storming up at the U.S. Cellular Field now with a big uh, matchup. Yeah, what we need is to slap them down. Corey McFerrin, is that what we're doing? <laughs> Slapping them down. Slapping them down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're trying. They really are. Yeah, this is the uh, classic Maalox moment for Sox fans who've been doubled over in pain 
for weeks. Here's the deal. As you know, Cleveland, Mark, you had it right, storming like crazy towards that top spot in the division. Right now, they trail the White Sox by just three and a half games going into tonight's action. They've won 33 of their last 44. On top of that, tonight, they go with Kevin Millwood. He's got the best earned run average in the American League, countered by, for the White Sox, Freddie Garcia, who's been fading very fast of late. He's won only one of his last eight starts. So that's the background. Here are the highlights. Ozzy and company. This is the biggest game of the year, no question. Indians score single runs in the first, second, third. Here in the fifth, one more. Travis Hafner takes Freddie deep. Sox in trouble. 4 nothing. Tribe. But don't give up the ship. In the fifth inning for the White Sox, Joe Creedy base knock will bring in Aaron Rowan. It's a 4-1 to one game. Then, after Scott Pesednik's single, it's Tadahito. Aguchi labels one to left. To the corner, Creedy is in. It's a 4-2 to two game. And there's more. Paul Canerco mired in a 4 for 27 slump. Crushes one to center. Grady Sizemore, no! A huge two-run, two-out double. Ties the game at four. How about that? Then in the Sox seventh, Carl Everett, and get the heck out of here. No, first of all, it's a great catch by Scott Pesednik on a ball hit by Coco Crisp. And then we go to the seventh inning. Carl Everett gets hold of one here off Raphael Betancourt. This sucker will go his 23rd. Carl only five for his last 36 prior to that blast. Again, the score 5 4. White Sox lead. They're in the eighth inning. A Sox win. They're four and a half up. If they lose, the lead is reduced to two and a half games. Now, if you're looking ahead, Here's the Sox remaining schedule. Two more here against the Tribe. Mark Burley will face Jake Westbrook tomorrow night. The Twins then come in for four games Thursday through Sunday. And then on the road, off to Detroit for four more before the Armageddon-like showdown in Cleveland. The final weekend of the season. It could come down to that. Hold on to your seat. Now, one decision that may Serve to lift this ball club a little bit happens today El Duque Orlando Hernandez pulled out of the rotation and the 22 year old rookie Brandon McCarthy will go in his place now McCarthy as you know has been very impressive this kid having uh, opened some eyes two and a half weeks ago when he made back to back score to start versus the Rangers and the Red Sox he will get the call on Thursday against the Twins. Do you think what you've done so far has prepared you well for what lies ahead? I think so. Um, I think just getting that first start in Wrigley kind of got a lot of that out of the way just right away. Um, the start in, in Boston kind of, you start to feel places that just kind of always have that playoff atmosphere. And I think once you kind of have that, it just it makes it a little easier. And I'll see you again Thursday when I, maybe I have all sorts of jitters. And, <laughs> but I think I'll be fine. Well, we certainly hope so. Update on the ball game here in the eighth inning. Cleveland just scores twice on an Aaron Boone single. So right now the Indians have a 6-5 lead here at the cell. Now, on a brighter note, how about them Bears? 38-6, still kind of hard to believe. That is a ball game you want to savor for a long, long time. And that's exactly what Bears fans did yesterday. I'll tell you what, contributions from every unit on the field, including the offense. Kyle Orton, the pretty toss for Moose Muhammad here. His first ever NFL touchdown pass. And on defense, Mike Brown is everywhere. Just ask Marcus Pollard. And that'll hurt. That'll cost Brownie some cash this week. I'm sure about that. But the swagger is back. It really was a big win for us. And uh, we celebrated last night. Seemed like it was a long time ago because now our thoughts are really gone toward uh, Cincinnati. It's 2-0 and right now. Carson Palmer's playing good. Marvin Lewis is doing a great job with his team. It'll be a big challenge for us, but we're excited about playing game two at home. I'm sure they are against the Bengals this coming Sunday. One of the Bears note for you, Adewale Ogunlia underwent an MRI today on his injured ankle. Results not available yet, but Lovey suggested today he believes that Adewale will be able to play Sunday against the Bengals. Again, the latest here from Sox Park. Sox trail 6-5 in the eighth. Again, if they can't pull this out, that lead will have shrunk to two and a half games, which is startling stuff, Robin and Mark, when you recall, August 1, the Sox held a 15-game lead in the division.
Pestilence. I'm just wanting you to get an apartment across the street there for the next three weeks. <laughs> we're camping out. I'm I telling you, where else, where else do you want to be? And we're going to be with them. I figured. By the next inning, we'll, we'll tell the tale, Corey. Yes, you got it. We got two more shots. Okay. Okay. Nice air-conditioned heated tent will do, I'm sure. Uh, hey, here's the latest track on Tropical Storm Rita. May even become a hurricane and could hit Houston in five days as a Category 3. No more rain tonight. No more rain for tomorrow morning. Matter of fact, the next three days look pretty good around here. As we head into autumn, it's still summer. Next best chance of any cool weather. Not anytime soon. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Now, the results of tonight's Voice Your Choice are question. Do you agree with the $6.2 million settlement in the Ryan Harris case that we reported toward the top of our newscast? The city reached the settlement today with a 15-year-old boy who was wrongfully accused in the girl's murder some years back. 32% say yes, you agree with the settlement. 68% say no, you don't. Thanks for letting us know what you think. And that's our news tonight. Thanks for watching. Fox News returns tomorrow morning at 5. Good night. Go Sox. Closed captioning on Fox News Chicago is brought to you by Luna Carpet. For the latest carpet styles and the convenience of shopping from home, call...